You know, my dad, many years ago, said when he first met my mom, he was over at a friend's house, they are having a barbecue, and he was standing there in the driveway with his buddy, and they were shooting hoops. And out of the, the car stepped this beautiful redhead that immediately caught his attention. And so eventually she works her way over there. They're standing in the driveway, and my dad being suave and debonair like he was at the time, could think of nothing else to say other than, do you want to shoot hoops? <laughs> and so they did. They shot hoops together. And as my mom tells it, they talked late into the night. And she went home that night and told her mom, I just met the man that I'm going to marry. So what, what was funny, though, that happened that night was my, my dad's friend was there. I think he kind of liked my mom, too. And so she was in the awkward position of having to decide what to do next. So she invited both of them to a family reunion the next day. And so they both came out. I think she made it pretty clear early on that she was more interested in my father. And, you know, the rest is history. So that's how they met. You know, we have all met women who are beautiful that are just a shade past their 20s. And though we might compliment them on their attire, you know, their, and their adornment, we all know that the most beautiful part of these women that we admire, it's on the inside, right? It's what comes out. And my mom is one of those women. You know, if you know my mom, um, she doesn't always spend a tremendous amount of time, you know, getting gussied up to step out. But I'll tell you that the warmth, the smile and the kindness that she radiates has touched countless lives. I wanted to smile just thinking about her. You know, she makes me laugh. She makes my kids laugh. It just There's a beauty about her that radiates, that really isn't tied to outward or external appearance. So today we're going to talk about how to be attractive. But don't worry, I'm not going to give any fashion advice. I'm not going to tell you how to get a great complexion. We're going to talk about what Peter calls unfading beauty. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 7 this morning. And as a note of introduction, near the end of chapter 2 in 1 Peter, Peter instructs believers to live good lives so that those outside the faith, even those in your own family, may see your good deeds and glorify God. He then instructs people to submit to authority and slaves to submit to their masters in keeping with the example of Jesus. In other words, Jesus accepted injustice for a purpose. Now hold on to that thought. Beginning in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. So in this church, there was... A number of situations where a wife had believed and the husband did not. And so he's challenging them to submit to your unbelieving husband so you can win them over by your behavior, not your words. Now, when we use words, we feel powerful, right? When we see somebody misbehaving, when we see somebody that's not something that's not right or we feel offended, man, I'm going to use my words and I'm going to tell you something. But it is our actions that are what really carry weight. Also, submit in this verse indicates that, you know, the, the wife is responding to her husband. And guys, you know, truth be told, we're usually the instigators, right? We're the ones causing all the trouble. I'll admit that that's me in my house. You know, sometimes I'll just insist on being right. And my wife might object at first, but when she realizes i got a head full of steam, she'll just kind of let me say my piece. She'll let me finish. And I don't think it's manipulative, but when I run out of steam and she just sits there quietly, lets me say my piece, then I start to feel a little bit embarrassed. You know, then I start to feel kind of ashamed. And then after just a short while, I, I start to apologize. This happened this weekend. And then I kind of make amends. And I'll, I'll apologize voluntarily. And, and so what she's done is in kind of letting me you know, kind of responding to me wisely, then she's setting the stage for me to get over myself. Now, this is not submit as a rule. This is, don't, don't, don't mistake this. Look at the scripture. This is submit for a purpose. Submit for a purpose so that you can win them over. 
And, and men, this this we're not all we don't get off easy on this. If our wives are having a hard time and we're responding poorly, then this this message is for us as well. So Peter is encouraging women to respond well in light of what is at stake. Now, if they're married to an unbeliever, likely their marriage is at stake, their testimony is at stake, the future spiritual health of their children is at stake, and a lot is riding on their response, on their behavior. So the first principle this morning is win them over, whether it's your husband or your wife, win them over with your behavior, not your words. Verse 2, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. So what is purity? Purity just simply is, I'm not looking out for me. Because when we're in a relational interaction, the temptation is, I'm going I'm to look out for number one. I'm going to make sure I'm taken care of. But purity says, I'm not looking out for me, I'm looking out for you. And I'm looking out for us. You know, you and me, our family. And, and reverence. You know, it, you know, reverence is, I'm not demanding something from you, I'm requesting. That's showing respect, it's showing reverence. So purity and reverence. You know, this works for men as well. Every time I'm with Mr. Peters, and I'm sad that he's not with, here with us this morning, every time I'm with Mr. Peters, I get the distinct impression that there's more to him than meets the eye. Don't you? You know, it's not just that twinkle in his eye when you ask him a question when he's telling a story. It's also that casual reluctance to kind of poke, to let the, the spotlight be on him. And you just know that man's got stories after story that he can tell, but he just chooses not to. So subtlety is powerful. And so Peter is challenging women to keep their composure under pressure. Because the truth is that posture and volume don't build your case. But poise and patience do. You know, this is meekness, not weakness. You know, the difference with meekness is it's a choice. I'm choosing not to power up. I'm choosing not to get loud. I'm choosing not to try to win the fight. Instead, I'm choosing to forbear, and I'm choosing to forgive. Verse 3, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. So he says, don't focus on outward adornment to become beautiful. Focusing on external beauty is a trap. It's a trap because there's always room for improvement and comparison. Think about our culture today. Isn't this a challenge? Culture says focus on the outside. Focus on what you wear. Focus on how you look. But it's a trap. You know, my wife is a beautiful woman. I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you that. But the thing that attracted me to her when we were in college, because there were some other, I mean, there are some other physically attractive gals in college. But it was her modesty that drew me. You know, she was beautiful, but she didn't, she wasn't on display, you know, look at me. She was modest, and that drew me to her. My prayer for my daughters is that they'll receive the same spirit. You know, there's a season to radiate what God has done in your life. You can tell beauty that comes from within. It's just obvious, it's clear. But this is different from being on display, right? Look at me, pay attention to me. And I'll be honest, as a man, I can immediately tell the difference. You know, this is as much a struggle for men now as it is for women, right? But the way we struggle is a little bit different. We get real focused on our reputation. Huh? You know, when I walk into a restaurant, when I'm out in the community, I want to be seen a certain way. I want to be known as being competent, capable, can get the job done. So it can become an idol for us as well, our reputation. So principle two is don't focus on your outside. Don't focus on your outside. Focus on what's inside. Don't focus on your outside, but your inside. Your response to God. Verse four. Instead, it should be that of your inner self. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. So what is the source of unfading beauty? Beauty that grows over time. It's a gentle and quiet spirit. You know, our society tells us that bold is beautiful, right? But the other side of the coin is that bold is abrasive. Continuous, 
boldness may border on brash, and it may actually burn bridges rather than build them. Now, I've had to learn this lesson the hard way. I grew up a bit of a class clown. I know you couldn't imagine that. A bit of a performer. Loved to make people laugh. But I've had to learn that there is a time and a place to be loud and fun and boisterous. But it's wise for a gentle and quiet spirit to be the melody of our lives. It's just wise. This is of great worth in God's sight. You know, who would be more receptive to God's voice and leading? Is it going to be the bold and the brash person? Or is it going to be the quiet and the gentle person? And, and right now, maybe you're this person, you're thinking of somebody. And you know that their actions and their presence in any situation carries a lot of weight. And we're thankful to God for that. This is something I love about our church. You know, there is a quiet strength, a quiet dignity here in our church. Our church is not a flash in the pan. It has been built and served by generations. And that's a real blessing. And she's going to hate me for pointing this out. I told you I would. But Miss Betty is a, is a wonderful example of quiet strength and dignity. And you know, that kind of beauty doesn't fade over time. Our respect for it grows. And so let that be our aim. But how? You know, this is tough, right? I mean, when we're facing life's challenges and we feel like we've got to bow up and take care of, our, take care of ourselves, this is a challenge. So what's the source of it? Verse 5. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands. Like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master, you are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Now hold on a minute. Let me unpack this. So this is the true source of a gentle and quiet spirit. It's that they had trust in God. They put their faith in God. Choosing to respond well to your husband or men, choosing to respond well to your wife, doesn't mean you have ultimate confidence in them. It shows that you have confidence in God. That in spite of your husband's, and I'll be honest, I'm, I'm this one, your husband's best efforts to make a mess of things, you choose to believe that God is bigger than his choices. He's bigger than our choices. When I transitioned to becoming a tent maker in China by taking a job, this was tough for Gracie. We had been missionaries for years. We were changing identities. We, I was changing careers. And she was wondering where was her place in this. And it was tough. But I'll tell you, she chose, rather than kind of disagree with me and make a big issue out of it, she chose to trust, not in me. Because she wasn't really sure exactly where things were headed. But she chose to trust in me. So you chose to trust that God was bigger than my choices. So here's the big lesson for today, and this is point number three. Our trust in God inspires us to treat our spouse well. I mean, this is where the rubber meets the road, right? It's our trust in God. What reasons do we have to trust God? He cares for us. Look at the pages of Scripture. Story after story is a God who's personal, a God who cares, a God who understands he sacrificed for us. He gave all for us. He sacrificed his son for us. And God is bigger. He's more powerful. He's more wise than our individual choices. You know, we feel so powerful in life, don't we? Like, I'm going to make something happen. I'm going to handle this. I'm going to do that. But really, we put our trust and faith in a God who's bigger than us and who's bigger than our choices says they did not give in to fear. Now, what kind of actions are motivated by fear, typically, in our lives? Fear typically causes us to do one of two things. Rash action, right? I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to respond to this. I'm going to make sure this goes my way. Or inaction. It says, I'm just along for the ride. It's not my, I'm not taking responsibility. I'm just going to kind of fade into the background and let things go however they go. That's what fear produces. And Peter's saying, don't choose the fearful response. So if a wife or husband chooses to withdraw or pacify their spouse, 
this isn't helpful, right? Fine, I do this, she does it too. It's like, whatever, you obviously have a strong opinion, you win. It's not helpful. But if instead we choose to aggressively prod and castigate our spouse, this isn't helpful. So what is a helpful response look like. The scripture's already told us it is pure, right? I'm not looking out for me. I'm looking out for you. I'm looking out for us. It is reverent. I'm not demanding. I'm requesting. And it flows from a gentle and quiet spirit which is rooted in faith in a God who's bigger than our choices. It is neither rash nor passive, but proactive. So husbands, wives, if we're looking to influence our spouse for good, then this is the kind of response that will be most useful and honoring to God. So the fourth principle is choose a proactive response out of reverence for Christ. You know, this is something that we're both learning, but I know this one truth with certainty. When our behavior towards one another gives evidence of our trust in God, you know what I'm talking about when we choose to forbear, when we choose to forgive, when we choose to be patient, when we choose to, to not be rash, but we're also not being passive and just letting them have their way. When our trust in God's evident, then we trust each other. I mean, who are you going to trust? Is it the person that's looking out for number one? Or is it the person who's, a, for them, God's opinion is their problem? Verse 7, last verse this morning. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. At this time, women did not have a very high position in society. In fact, they were commonly regarded as nothing more than the property of their husbands. Can you imagine that? What a terrible situation. A lot of times women were just property. They were owned by their husbands. So this command for men would have been very provocative. Can you imagine a society like that? Where your wife's just one, one more of your possessions. And then Peter's saying, hey, treat them with respect. Be considerate of them. Treat them as co-heirs in Christ. You know what they'd have said? They said, Peter, you just moved from preaching to meddling, sir. And we might just show you the door. But he didn't shy away because this is what's true and this is what's right. He says it's the weaker partner. As co-heirs. Now culturally, again, women didn't own property. They were property. And Peter says they're co-heirs. They're equals. Co-equals with you. And then he, he kind of winds it up by saying your treatment of your spouse can hinder your relationship with God. So in other words, God cares how you and I treat our spouses. And this is the way to have a marriage that causes us not just to celebrate marriage, but to celebrate the God that we serve, who inspires us to treat people in a way that's not natural, but in a way that's supernatural. So for you today, wives, is it difficult to respond well to your husband? Is this a joke, right? Is it difficult to respond well to your husband? When you're concerned with our choices and behavior, is it difficult to bite your tongue? I would imagine so. I, I mean, I can't speak for my wife, but she's giving me the half nod. That's, that's cautious, but, you know, it's <laughs> honest. What if you could choose to respond well in light of what is at stake? Your marriage, your testimony, the well-being of your children. On another note, ladies, is it tempting to focus on external beauty rather than your internal response to God? Think of women you would consider truly beautiful. You're thinking of one right now. It might be a mom, it might be a grandma, it might be a close friend. What is it that makes them beautiful? Is it the jewelry? Is it the clothing? Is it the makeup? Or is it what's in their heart? That's where true, that is a message that my daughters and the women across the nation need to hear. That is of great worth in God's sight. It's what's inside. And that's where beauty comes from, the kind of beauty that doesn't fade. Husbands, are you considerate with your wives? Or is it easy to just kind of go my own way? Huh? I know what needs to happen. There will be no discussion. This is something we struggle with. 
You treat them with the respect that is due them. You know, they were his before they were ours. And if you want a really scary thought, men, they're still daughters of king. Do we treat them at least as important as ourselves when we make decisions? And then finally, Christians, this is an all skate. Are you tempted to give in to fear when relating to your spouse? Are you given either rash action, right? I'm going to respond. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to make sure this goes the right way. Or is it tempting for you to, to give in to inaction, right? Have it your way. I'm just going to go mow them on, you know, or whatever it is that you do to escape. Would you be willing to choose the pure, you know, I'm, I'm looking out not for me, but for you and for us, the reverent act that says, I'm not demanding, but I'm requesting that flows from a gentle and quiet spirit which is rooted in faith, neither rash nor passive, but proactive. Are you willing to make that choice? Would you be willing to trust God and treat your spouse well for His sake? Like we said last week, because of Jesus, even when it's hard, because there's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake. Are you willing to show that God's opinion is your priority? And think of what a difference we could make in this world and in our homes if we could just get this right. You know, I don't watch the news a tremendous amount, but my heart's been broken this week. Seeing the hardship, seeing the hate. And if we're going to make a difference in this nation, it's going to start with you and me. It's going to start with husbands and wives caring well for each other, caring well for their children, and then caring well for those who don't have people looking out for them, for children who are going unguided. And it's going to take courage, but it starts here. It starts with us trusting God enough to treat our spouses well. Trusting God enough to treat our children well, our fellow Christians well, our neighbors well. Think about it. Husbands and wives committed to making a difference through behavior rather than words. You start a revolution, huh? Think about it, just a group of people where they say talk is cheap, but actions are weighty. Actions change things. Pure and reverent behavior that flows from a gentle and quiet spirit rooted in an unwavering faith in a God who is bigger than our choices and who is bigger than our mistakes. What if we valued each other at least as much as we valued ourselves? Then together we could celebrate marriage for the picture that it was meant to be. A picture of the relationship that God wants to have with each and every one of us. Pray with me. God, thank you for this morning and just for my friends here. As we consider the institution of marriage, God, what you designed for it to be, you designed for it to be an encouragement, God to draw close to you, an invitation, God, to draw close to you. And so, God, we just pray for your inspiration. We pray that we'll trust you enough, God, that we'll believe what you say to the point that we're willing to delay our words and to seek to make a difference through our actions. You're so good, Lord. And I just love the example of your son Jesus throughout Scripture where there were times when he spoke and there were times when he was silent. <laughs> He just did what needed to be done. So I just pray, God, that you would continue to move us and lead us each day as we care well for our spouses, as we care well for our children, as we seek to be obedient servants that are just following you as we make a difference in our, in our society and in our culture. God, we love you so much, and we're so thankful for your leading and your guidance. It's, Jesus, it's in Jesus' name I pray.